and let folks uh, sort of sidle into chat and we'll get underway with tonight's stream in about two minutes. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get underway with the evening stream then. Hold on just a second. Adjusting the mic. Whew. Sorry about that, that was probably particularly loud. <laughs> My mic just fell over. Um, Alright, there we are. Well, welcome back to another Overanalyst stream. My name is Brady and I'm going to be with you as we play through... Uh, at least a few more chapters of Hand of Fate 2 tonight, we are reaching the point, ladies and gentlemen, in the game that I, I played up to um, when I first uh, took the game on a couple years ago. So I think beyond... It's either Strength or the Hermit. Like, if I have played anything over here, I haven't a great recollection of it. Um... But I, I think Strength is the last chapter I definitely remember very, very clearly. Um, so, a lot of things are going to be either new or good as new to me from here on out. And remember, the first time I played the game, none of the uh, DLC packs with the additional suits of enemies and companions and any of that had been released. So, uh, a lot of this is going to be new and exciting for us uh, as we carry on. Um, so that said, let's begin tonight's adventure jumping right in to the Chariot. This one's a really cool chapter. I do remember it very, very well. A plague of corruption is spreading through the downtrodden denizens in the Old City. Aid Estrella and her loyal soldiers and find a way for the citizens to escape. Captain Estrella Fior, if you recall, uh, appeared as an NPC in the Emperor chapter where she seemed to be one of, like, sort of the, the token good teammate of the Empire, uh, casting a lot of doubt on the Emperor and his policies and or, um, effectiveness and things like that. So we're going to get to work with her in this chapter against the Corrupted once again. So, the special mechanics for this particular uh, chapter include, uh, quite similar to the first Corrupted chapter, uh, rescuing... Uh, NPCs, quite a lot of them in this regard. We're going to rescue uh, non-infected townsfolk trapped in this uh, beridden city in an attempt to uh, unlock more, well first off, to uh, unlock the second token for this card, but also to unlock additional equipment and things like that. Apparently the more people we save, the more options we'll have available uh, to us in the trade menu at camp. And uh, we'll have a lot of Pendulum Gambits in this chapter, which is fine. Uh, pendulum is probably one of the 
least offensive types of chance game we've come across so far. Oh, and it looks like, as you'll see, of the game's original four companions, we'll earn one at the end of this chapter, and one at the end of the next. And let's see, I just want to see what else we have here, since we did get two new companions through DLC. Um, Hubie the Orphan acts as a decoy in combat, which is alright. And it looks like he can dodge a lot of attacks and things, that's interesting. Oh, and look, the uh, little cloth um, in the upper right-hand corner is not a feature of the card, it's actually being wrapped around it. You can see it moving around there, I've never noticed that before, very, very cool. And um, from camp, he can uh, reset the charges on a grenade. Uh, that doesn't sound fantastic. Now, we've seen her in combat and know that she's great. Katora can fire, um, like, her blunderbuss and just eviscerate enemies in front of her. Uh, we can also accept bounties in camp and earn gold so she can help us, like, keep our resources up. Interesting. Uh, we're gonna go back to Malaclips for now, just because we are so, so close to finishing his, uh, companion quest line. And aside from that, hold on. What's your recommended deck? Good. What supplies do they encourage us to take? We've got the Healing Spirits, which uh, will basically heal us for 30 health and three disbursements of 10 points apiece. Not bad. Merchant's Ring, uh... Yeah, I would say these are probably the two best supplies to take into this map out of what we've got. Something that's effective against the Corrupted. And uh, just a bit of extra food. In terms of equipment, I don't know why they're so fond of giving me the standard shield. I mean, yes, it provides more defense than something like the Valiant Aegis, but the points kind of moot when you can block just about, or I should say, um, counter just about anything, you know? Got the Pious Robes, that's good. Got the Lord's Diadem, that's fantastic. Um, hmm, Ring of Food, Berserker's Creed. That's all fine. I mean, I think we've kind of got to take Kretha's ire. So maybe we'll take Kretha's ire in place of the Cardinal Blade. Well, hold on, what's the, the shard here? Oh, just activate the weapon ability. Okay, so I'm actually going to, for once, not take Son of Huge Hammer and instead bring along the Cardinal Blade, just because I want to get some of these shards that are on um, various cards. Oh, and the Lord's Diadem also slows down the uh, speed of Pendulum Gambits. That's great. Um, okay, I think we might be good here. Are we good? Light of Truth. Ah, the Gambler's Jewel. Sorry, we always want the Gambler's Jewel. So, if we can just get rid of the Ring of Food. Gambler's Jewel. There we go. And Encounters. What do we have? The Road to Goblin Town. Um, they're not overly fond of giving us things that have tokens, are they? I'll keep the Dark Alleys, because that might be a combat encounter, and those are always just kind of fun. Um, we'll take Mal's next encounter. We don't necessarily need that card. Nor do we need that one. Oh, let's take the duel, because we're working our way through that little mini-quest line where, you know, we're, um... Squaring off against that increasingly arrogant Imperial Captain. All things we've unlocked the tokens for. Um, hmm. What about the Goblin Retainer? There we go. 
It'll be a slightly goblin-centric deck this time around, but that is fine by me. I quite like the little guys. All right, let's get started. I don't recall this one being too hard, but we'll see. It even touches me. My power keeps it at bay. But these are the seals that Callus has attempted and failed to place upon my return. Off, you'll remember Sir Malafowl is the guy who hi er, hires us to do the um, Popper's Plague job. The one, you know, who just wants to completely eradicate the uh, impoverished district that's been overrun by the, the corruption. Sir Malafowl looks down from the back of his steed at the soldiers lined rank and file before him. The city is lost to the plague, he says dryly. We will not waste another soldier on this place. He gives the final command. In the name of the Emperor, prepare to withdraw. Block the gatehouses, let no one through. At sunrise, burn the city to the ground. Without hesitation, the soldiers march down the cobbled street toward the western gatehouse. A single soldier remains, a captain. She removes her helm to reveal a quiff of golden hair and an eye patch concealing a wound from a battle long ago. She approaches you in Malaclips. Probably, I want to say my second favorite companion in the game in terms of, like, uh, lore and flavor. Many innocent people will die come morning if nothing is done to correct this injustice, she explains. I ask that you aid my men in their search for citizens to escort out of the old city. Hurry, nightfall fast approaches. Find and rescue citizens and escort them out of the city so we've got 60 of them to round up. That is a tall order, believe you me, but we're going to do our best to save as many as we possibly can. MC2M says hello. Hey man, how's it going? Resident Hand of Fate expert in the house, ladies and gentlemen. We're getting started with the Chariot chapter, which is probably one of my favorites that I distinctly remember. I'm Captain Fior, she says with a bow. I've been commanding my regiment on the northern border. My troops and I were recalled to the old city and were ready to march back to the capital. However, it appears the Empire has neglected its people in our absence. I cannot abandon those we have sworn to protect. I anticipated, I anticipated Malafowl's intentions and my scouts have made preparations. To the southwest is a gatehouse, abandoned when the infected broke through. If we can clear the corrupted from this district, we can escort any citizens through with minimal resistance. So. The more corrupted we defeat, or rather, once we defeat all of the corrupted in a given district, we can proceed on through to the next. So, there's two objectives we have to meet. Overall, we want to save at least 60 citizens, or we want to save all 60, I should say, as many of that uh, total as we can. And in every uh, district, so on every little map, we need to clear out a certain number of the corrupted. Ask if it can be done. Fear not. There are soldiers that remember the virtue of the Empire who remain loyal to her people. I have a number of scouts searching the streets for citizens as we speak. They'll assist where they can. And the plague. A terrible tragedy, to be sure. While the Empire's eyes are on the northern border, it has abandoned its people to this unnatural plague. Do not be fooled. This is no ordinary malady. Its affliction maddens and warps the minds of those it corrupts, turning friend family, or lover into a mindless agent of hate and aggression. The Empire is right to fear its rapid spread and potential reach. However, there are many who call this city home, who have not been damned. Not yet. It is these souls I intend to save this night. The old city was once the hub of the world. Great artisans, traders, and merchants would travel from far and wide to sell their wares here. While it still houses many, it's a shadow of its former glory. A muddle of streets, and in light of the plague, many roads have been blocked. All right, let's get underway. My coachman will follow and transport any citizens you might find along the way. If you're lucky, they may be of assistance in your travels. Search the streets and kill the infected. I will send word when the way is cleared. All right, so... Yeah, let's, let's get underway. Here, unlike many um, chapters, most chapters, I should say, we're going to have to reveal the actual topography of the map itself as we go. So, we'll just have to explore, and as always, we want to explore as much as we can to rescue those citizens. Everywhere the rock touches, and everywhere bears its stains. 
Tall buildings line the streets, their lower windows boarded up with planks of wood on imperial order. A futile attempt to hinder the spread of the plague. What are you sacrificing when you stop to help them? Have you asked yourself that? You happen upon a group of frightened peasants, desperately seeking safety. We hear the empires abandon the city, they cry. Please help us. You explain Captain Fuhrer's plan and help him onto the wagons. That's already eight citizens saved. I promise you it's not going to be that easy for most of the chapter. We are grateful, a woman says as she steps into the carriage. I haven't much food, but should you need some, I would be willing to trade. So we've unlocked more trade goods at camp. As well as another Iron Peak card. We'll want to get around to that one a bit later on. The pauper district has been hit by looters, leaving shops with broken windows and empty shelves. Surgery must be done with precision if it is to be effective. You find yourself surrounded by the corrupted horde that broke through the gatehouse and wandered into the district. They shuffle mindlessly back and forth on the spot, limbs twitching, seemingly unaware of your presence. So we're going to take out ten of the required twelve blighted uh, units present in this district. Doesn't mean there's only twelve here, of course, but this is going to get us a healthy uh, measure towards our goal. You know, we don't always have to fight everything we see, Malaclips whispers. You draw your weapon and prepare to take the group by surprise. Okay, and it's a pendulum gambit. I will be satisfied with a regular success, thank you very much, let's not get greedy. They're just corrupted too, it's not like, oh, and we already take care of two of them. The remaining infected stand by idly, twitching and writhing in sickness. Malaclips pats you on the back. Good job. I'm proud of you. I guess I should join in on this fight. Oh, that's right, we get a chance to take out more of them. I believe the red blocks indicate a standard failure, and the pit of fire at the base of the little, uh... Um, device here indicates a huge failure. So, as long as it lands on some block, we're good at this point. And it looks like we take down another one. Nicely timed. It's a shame, I was kind of looking forward to fighting something. With a flurry of strikes, you fell the infected before they can retaliate. And we have to fight five of them now. No problem at all. MC2M says it's the reverse, the pit is failure, and the red is huge failure. Okay. I didn't remember that clearly, but I, I will say this. I'm grateful that this chapter is heavy on pendulum gambits, because, and I could be wrong here, along with the dice gambits, they seem to be the easiest to manipulate in your favor, like to get quote-unquote right, as they're purely games of skill. Barely more than a woodchopper's tool, but this warrior's axe will do the job, kids. Check that out. They're hardy, but that's about it. Ooh. Oh, that's brutal. And it's beautiful. And I shouldn't say these guys are like the skulls, because... As of our reunion with the latter faction last night, we've seen that, uh... The poor Skulls have somehow become even weaker in this game. I mean, I, I love them to death. I think they've got great design, but... Pendulum is pure skill, but I get the sense they're a bit rhythm-based. Yeah, they definitely are. They and the, uh... I think they call them wheel gambits that Malaclips can assist with. That appears to be the last of them, Malaclips remarks. You continue your journey through the winding streets. We gain four fame, and get both... Oh, we get to go back to the duel once again. This is one of my favorite little quest lines. A drunkard claps your back in an imperial tavern. You're the mercenary who made that brilliant remark about the Emperor's wide forehead. What a lark! Before you can respond, he is pushed aside by the furious Captain Cassius. You again! Uh, MC2MS, did I bring the bloodletting vial? It's in my deck, yes. 
And here we go again. Looks like we're just thrashing Captain Cassius one more time. This is one of my favorite of the, like, recurring uh, non-plot encounters. And it also, I believe, acts as a bit of a warm-up for this chapter's boss. Exceedingly simple. And the second time we've had to beat this poor guy into sobriety. Also the second time he's caught me off guard with that initial unblockable attack. There we go. And that should do it for him. Duel progresses with the number of challenges completed, too. Um, that's interesting. So we get some fame. I'll take it. And we'll go see what's over here next. You pass through without incident. It's kind of boring, but okay. The Goblin Retainer. And we'll try to do these special encounters last. Also empty. The Road to Goblin Town. That'll be interesting. Nothing once again. Signs of mass departure are everywhere. Homestand empty. All that remain are crumbling ruins. Ooh. A bunch of farmers against the Blight. This is not gonna be pretty, folks, because uh, the Toil class has an unfortunate tendency to just throw themselves into the middle of battles that they cannot possibly win. The unmistakable sound of combat alerts you to a group of townsfolk being attacked by the infected. One brave warrior struggles to hold back the horde. You rush to their aid. So our priority here, of course, is taking down the corrupted as fast as we possibly can before the farmers just feed themselves to them. Oh, a couple of the farmers actually have guns. That's helpful. Let's see. We might be able to handle this. And it looks like one of them got taken down but didn't die. That's, uh, that's hopeful. <laughs> Oh, we saved them all. Great. You arrived just in time, the warrior explains. I don't think I could have held them off for much longer. I could part with some equipment, he continues. I don't think it'll do me much good now. See me if you're interested in a trade. You explain Captain Fiora's plan and help the survivors onto the wagons. The stench of corruption flows across the cities, tainting everything it touches. And we defeated enough of the corrupted. We bring word from Captain Fiora, the soldier explains with a salute. The infected horde at the next gatehouse has subsided. But there is a problem. Corruption grows from the ground itself, blocking all passage from the wagons. It must be destroyed. She asks that we join you in your efforts, the soldier continues. Should you require our assistance, you need only ask. So this is a unique uh, transient blessing. Uh, prior to any five combats of our choice, we can uh, draw an Imperial card, so like just standard Legionaries, to act as support in battle. We want to be kind of judicious of our use of those particular cards. Um, let's check out the Goblin Retainer real quick. I can't determine whether you're the sort of person to put their faith in goblins, or merely the sort to give their actions no thought. Just in case. 
The tower is in chaos. Alarm bells have the garrison soldiers in a panic. As you watch, a goblin with a hefty sack leaps from a window, dangling from a makeshift rope. He bounces painfully off the wall as he lowers himself to the ground. The castle doors fly open. Guards assemble, armed and angered. In that case, if he looks like he's going to be on our side, we'll just go right back over here. The goblin blows his horn, discharg discharging little more than a feeble hiss. I need a moment to recharge this. Help me and I'll split my takings. Before you can reply, he throws you an item from his sack. Here's your retainer, he says. Some gold, I'll take it. The guards rush forward. Arrest them! They're with the goblins! Uh, we definitely do not need the help here. And I'm not entirely sure they'd be terribly thrilled in aiding and abetting theft uh, from the Empire. We fought these guys often enough to know how this goes at this point. Want to go for the Musketeers first? Uh, well, I said that, but our poor goblin buddy is going to be in danger more or less constantly, it looks like. It's nice to actually fight on one of these annoying little guys' side for once. There we go. And we got them all in less than a minute. Not too bad. Yeah, you know what? I'm... I'm not entirely, uh, like, uh, disabused of my love of the, uh, uh, one-handed weapon, uh, sword and board combo, but I'm pretty damn fond of the, uh, the two-handed weapons, especially as we get stronger and stronger ones. Hearing the shouts of additional guards, the goblin summons a portal and drags you in. The three of you fall through a seemingly endless tunnel of swirling stars. Oh. I will redraw. That looks to be a curse. Fifteen gold, I'll take it. Oh, that was a blessing? My mistake. I see Ally's Folly with a skull near the base of the card, and the image itself being a skull with, like, a claymore run through it, and I immediately think, you know what, this game has screwed me over enough times, I'm not chancing it. You see the goblin ahead. His sack tears open and his loot tumbles toward you. After what seems like a lifetime, the portal releases you somewhere in the depth of the forest. You eventually find a path and continue on your way. Your majestic disappearing act has become the talk of the town. And we get a little token. Nice. We'll check out these city streets really quickly. Right, right. Nice, empty city streets. And before we stop by, well, no, we may actually want to buy some food right now. The city falls around you. Oh, and since these are all people we rescued, they're selling us items dirt cheap. One food for one coin? That is honestly a pretty damn good deal for Hand of Fate. We'll take it all. And equipment, what do you got? Eh, Cardinal Blade, not really necessary. Now we'll head to Iron Peak. These tokens represent the expansion of the game. Which I believe, yeah, this is the same card we, uh, More opportunities. we encountered the first time we met the Bounty Hunter. 
So all we have to do is the same thing, only explore these different options, I believe. Let's ask about protection from the Prince of Poisons. The boy looks around to make sure nobody is watching too closely, then discreetly takes a small vial of colorless liquid from his pocket. This tonic was brewed from the fruit of a rare plant that only grows high on the northern hills. It'll boost your strength, give you the edge you need to survive the poison. I like you, stranger. I'm a fair judge of character, and you seem like a good sort. For you, this is only five gold. I don't care if it's a scam or not, we'll take it. And it isn't a scam. We get a little bit of max life. That is not bad at all. A sudden scream as you're reaching for your weapon and sends the crowd into a panic. And it's... Yeah, some more... Thieves. So... We get to work with... Um, our companion again, that's great. We don't need the help, and they're not even being backed up by an assassin this time, so... This should be particularly easy, even with a heavy weapon, yeah? Nothing like the smell of gunpowder. There we go. I do really like the look of these guys. Oof. Actually clipped me. That was a good job on their part. I can't believe we had um, the kind of run we did on Hierophant last stream. That was simply incredible. Um, we got a perfect run on our first try, and in my experience, at least with the, like, maybe ten or so chapters I played, that one is far and away the easiest to botch horribly. Oh, we get even more max life. And our health topped up. Or topped off. Great, great. And it's the same conclusion from before. We'll have to revisit one more time to drop by the market, and that should allow us to complete the uh, Iron Peak quest line and get the token. More grateful citizens, same exact event as before. We throw them in the back, get more food. The drudge of corruption, once again. We'll fight him, as always. MC2M says Hierophon is the first gold slash thinking challenge. It's a good teacher for what comes after. Yeah, I definitely got the sense it was introducing a lot of really cool mechanics that would be expanded on a bit later. I think the reason why I uh, didn't have a great time with it the very first time I played Hand of Fate 2 was because, as I said, I think in an earlier stream, I always prioritized putting it, uh, cards that had available tokens into my deck over those that might actually be strategically viable. Uh, when I actually built a deck around getting a ton of gold or uh, buffing my dice gambit results, things went really, really well extremely easily. And the flavor of the quest, I should point out, is fantastic. I really, really like the plot. Down to six, blighted, which is fine. I kind of want to get as much combat in as I can in this chapter because, A, we may or may not get some spoils from them. I don't know if you do these particular encounters. I'll have to pay attention this time. Uh, but, B, uh, if we use our Axe's finishing attack X amount of times, we should unlock its shard. Or token. I'm not sure if this weapon has a token or a shard. For a lot of pieces of equipment, it seems to be the latter, thanks to that free DLC. Ooh. 
weapon token, you believe? Okay. It seems like a lot of the uh, pieces of equipment that fall under supplies, uh, so the, the more commonplace ones, or ones they expect you to spend more time with, have tokens associated with them, while those that do not, just random components of your equipment deck, tend to have shards. Not uniformly, but that broadly seems to be the case. MC2M also says there's an achievement to finish Hierophant with 200 gold. Oof. Um, I could definitely see earning 200 gold, but uh, earning 200 gold and getting just enough information to safely accuse the proper assassin, that'd be a little tricky. Okay. Now we'll head on down to Goblin Town. They say the road to Goblin Town is paved with gold and dead mice. Horus, son of the village idiot, has lured you to this forest cave with the promise of a hidden treasure. You regret everything. Just through there, he points into a dark cavern. I saw a goblin hurrying into that hole not a moment ago. Goblin Town is in there. I'm sure of it. Oh, and it looks like it's going to be another one of those little uh, trap maze exploration dealies from the first Hand of Fate. Right on. I quite like these, actually. Yeah, it's shards to improve the supplies. In the first game, it was unlocking levels as you progressed. Okay, very good. Good to know. I will say I really appreciate the way Hand of Fate characterizes its goblins. They're like duplicitous and kind of mischievous as your standard fantasy goblins. But without the technological aptitude they tend to be known for in a lot of generic fantasy works, they're also absolutely brilliant mages and, like, artisans. I can't wait to see more of them in the uh, DLC. Or I should say more of their army. Just trying to get as much gold as I can here. On the whole, these traps are much easier to dodge than those in the first game. Nothing over here, right? This is just another way I could have come? Yes, okay. And they're even kind enough to give you a little bit of health back. MC2M says this is an easy trap level. I, I kind of figured, uh, but still, it felt like the controls of the character in these types of levels as well are, is just a bit more... I forgot a food chest. Oh, man, that's a shame. Uh, it feels like the control in that type of environment is a little bit more uh, responsive. In Hand of Fate 1, due to issues with camera control, or uh, camera... Um, perspective or controls in tight spaces, moving the character in the kind of environment or encounter it's not really ideally designed for, it felt a little clunky. That actually felt pretty good. Horus is crestfallen when you tell him that Goblin Town wasn't down there. You didn't find the Goblin either? Probably used their wily magics. I tell you what, if you manage to get your hands on a Goblin, they might lead you there. So we get our token. And we got a fair amount of uh, gold out of our little sojourn. Not bad at all. Careful. Your supplies are running low. The smell of rotting flesh lingers in the air. The gatehouse tower looms over you, its sides encrusted with the taint of corruption. The captain greets you as you approach. It is as the scouts reported, Malaclip says, that corruption will block the path for the wagons. Now make haste. We'll protect the wagons with my scouts. You two clear the way. So we're going to be introduced to two new Blight units in one encounter here. The Blight Affliction, which I believe is um, just a slightly tougher um, Blight Foot Soldier, and the rather unique Blight Spires, kind of these stationary crystalline totems that are going to serve as effective mini-bosses in this chapter at several different points. Our axe should be able to hack it apart in a short order. No problem. 
Uh, we're going to go ahead and call in Astraea's scouts just because I think it's um, kind of contextually appropriate. It makes sense to have them here fighting alongside us. One thing I appreciate about Hand of Fate 2's chapters is they're much longer than those of Hand of Fate 1, but due to all of the chapter exclusive cards and encounters and things like that, they all feel so much more distinct uh, and... Well, progressing through the game feels a bit less of a slog as it, it draws on. Here we go, the corruption. The land itself becomes shattered, shambling and broken. Attacks with bursts of corruption that snare and damage their targets. Use evade to avoid their attacks or change direction rapidly to break free. So basically this thing is um, uh, an AOE sort of ranged support unit that we can break apart in fairly short order if we focus on it. It has armor too, of course. And one of those defensive AoE attacks that magic users in this game seem to love so, so much. These are the afflicted. Come on, Mal, let's get us that shield. And if you break the armor on the corruption, as you can see, you don't even need to finish it in the style of a blight terror. That's just it. It's down. Speaking of down, let's pick Mal's sorry ass up off the ground. Come on, there we go. And yeah, the afflicted are the uh, corrupted uh, enemies with those sort of smaller versions of the Terror's Club Arms. And I think they do just serve as an elite foot soldier, but I could be wrong. There we go. Nice and easy. The Imperial Scouts didn't help too much, but hey, they were there and that's what mattered. Captain Fior addresses you. You have a steady swing. Excellent, soldier. It will only be more difficult from here on. I bear no ill will towards you if you choose to leave now. So at any point as we carry on through this city, we can choose to just pull out. But obviously we want to save all the citizens we can, right? Of course we do. Um, and only when we try to leave the city will we actually uh, enter into the, the real conflict of this chapter. So we're going to keep, uh, keep progressing onward. What is it the towers will watch over? A stream of death and despair? The tower provides a commanding view over the once impressive city. As you pause to catch your breath, you watch the last of the sun's rays disappear over the horizon. Malaclip shakes your shoulder and points over the battlements to the south. Okay, uh, MC2M says, uh, The afflicted of blight have an unblockable normal attack, but are like the normal soldiers otherwise. Okay, so not much of a difference at all. They look really cool, though, I have to say. There you see the final gatehouse, its tower rising from the wall of the old city to the south. Have you ever seen so many? Malaclips remarks as you watch the infected swarm over the city wall. How can the Empire let its people suffer so? Malaclips mutters under his, under his breath, and then abandon those in need. As you continue to look, a small glow appears on the horizon beyond the city perimeter. First one, then another, and another. The Empire! Malaclips cries. They're preparing to burn the city. We must get the people to safety. Let us hope we're not too late. Going to stop by camp real quick to buy some food. We 
which is thankfully still very, very affordable. Wish all the merchants we did favors for would be this generous. What's over here? The river's water, now a putrid green, emanates with a miasma that turns your stomach. If there is a finer mind than my own, I've yet to meet it. Yet, I've brought a scourge of mindlessness into this world, and must suffer the results. A wounded peasant runs stumbling down the street, chased by a horde of corrupted. He falls at your feet and begins to twitch. The blood from his wounds boils and blackens. We're gonna fight the corrupted to see if there's anything we can do to help out here, obviously. I've already been putting some thought into what I should stream after uh, Hand of Fate 2, which, uh, judging by the, the rate at which we're progressing, probably won't be over for a good while. This game's probably got at least another week in it, if not more. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, as far as what's accessible to me on PS4 right now, I want to play one of my favorite platformers of all time, Followed up by a platformer I've played very little of, but generally understand to be considered one of the worst, um, like, really big-name, uh, platform titles to be released, uh, in the past couple of console generations. Play them back-to-back -back and just sort of see what we think of each, eh? Hey? There we go. That's the Terror Town. And the last of the Blight Zombies. With the Horde defeated, the townsfolk rushed to tend the peasants. They're grateful for your protection. Here we see oh no. The wheel, each different, yet each bearing their own similarities. Gain food. Very good. No, no, no. I'll, I'll take it. The peasants hand you some food as they board the wagons. Save more citizens and can see the streets all around us. The spread of plague has rendered the district a blackened maze. The crust of contagion warps cobblestones and weakens foundations, making progress perilous. With every step, oh, hungry poppers. Perfect. You spy a group of poor urchins loitering in an alley. They look hungry. As you approach, they scramble into a pile of discarded crates. Oh man, should I just explain I'm here to help, or offer them food, and in the process lose most of my food? Like, I don't want to cause them to run off, as we're ideally supposed to be saving them all. MC2M says just give some food. Okay. That's fair enough. It's the safe bet. And there's a ton of them. The eldest child reaches out gingerly and snatches the food, devouring it in an instant. Hunger overcomes the rest of the group, and they crawl from their hiding places to gobble up the food. Their trust gained, they board the wagons. And we resume our journey. All right. Dark alleys. Um, I'll take it because it might be a combat encounter that gives us some stuff. Offers you a choice. Sometimes they are both poor choices. While roaming the dark alleyways of the capital, you see a suspicious group traveling in your direction. Frost. Okay, so some barbarians and a bunch of their like best buddies, the reanimated skeletons. Um. Well, after what we saw in Hand of Fate 1, we know that the Court of Skulls has some excellent PR skills. They, they work with all types of outlaws and people living on the periphery of society, left, right, and center, and apparently have for quite some time. They're really very good at this whole community outreach thing. Uh, certainly better than Callus ever was. They're dragging a locked chest behind them, its contents unknown. In another direction, we spy an item glinting in the moonlight. 
it's just the Cardinal Blade. However, we notice a number of shadowy forms lurking in the alley. I'll go toward the visible enemies with the locked chest because I'd rather take a chance at uh, getting absolutely nothing and defeat some somewhat fun enemies than just get the Cardinal Blade and end up selling it. You approach the men with the chest. They drop their cargo and draw their blade, saying, Solana said no witnesses. MC2M says both options result in combat. Oh, I know. I, I remember this particular encounter. But, um, honestly, I really didn't want the Cardinal Blade. No. Oh, fighting the Skulls is so satisfying. We are definitely going to unlock this card's token after this chapter. It's very easy to build up its special attack. Only five hits. Even compared to the lower thresholds for a lot of the two-handed weapons, I suppose to compensate for their relatively slow swing speed, that's still very, very um, accessible. And <laughs> down he goes and glitches his way into a boat. <laughs> Have a feeling that one's not getting up in the morning. There we go. Got the token. Excellent. The custodian's defeated, we break open the locked chest and get some health uh, uh, secret compartment. We may get this, we may not. Okay. Hey, right on the money. We find some equipment hidden in the secret compartment. The Dark Thirst. A heavy weapon that requires less damage to cause knockdown to the corrupted. Deals more damage. Uh, perform a powerful strike that causes 200% damage as opposed to the Warrior's Axe's 250 on six hits. Uh, defeat 50 corrupted to unlock the token. Might as well start... Uh, working our way towards the token requirement. I, th I say, anyhow. Um, city streets. The burning rubble. Now, I think the fire effect here is purely for aesthetic purposes. This is not a brimstone card. Uh, with a terrible crash, the building beside you is struck by a flaming catapult shot. The building heaves and twists from the impact and crumbles across the street in front of you. Malaclip shields the, his eyes from the blaze. Quickly, we must find another way. You turn the wagons around and search for another road through the district. There's gonna be a few of those here. The Drudge of Corruption. Got no problem fighting them. Oh, it's been made more difficult. That'll get rid of the affliction, or one unit of the affliction. There we go. And that's the terror done. So one unit of the afflicted and one unit of the corrupted. We should get the proper introduction for the afflicted now if they don't do the uh, Dark Thirst weapon intro. Yeah, here we go. A simple design, but pretty cool nonetheless. The Inflicted. The rot grants power before it grants release. Muscle replaced with darkness, organs pumping black bile through shattered veins. Infected enemies are feeble, causing them to become knocked down when health is low, use a finisher before they recover. Same thing we saw with the standard, um, Corrupted. There we go. Quite like the look of our new hammer, too. Oop, down he goes.
Now, one thing I will give the standard uh, corruption uh, foot soldiers uh, is that they are rather tanky. Like, I mean, even from a heavy weapon, they can take many, many blows before even dropping to a knee. And our work here is done. And we are now starving, that's great. Is there any food in camp? No, there's not. Well, crap. I'm certain we can find some somewhere, though. Come on. Just need one encounter with some friendly peasants. This is bad luck. This is really, really bad luck. Ah, plague again. Okay. Corruption is but a small part of it. The weird thing is, I included like plenty of cards that would allow us to gain food in the um, encounter deck, but just no dice. Yeah, this is a pretty solid looking weapon. Bound with a great longing for the taste of corruption and blight. Could, could I just eat these guys instead? Like, gonna need to get food somehow. I mean, technically that rot's gonna try to eat me, right? So I mean, only fair. That's weird. I actually got knocked out of my finisher, I think. There we go. I got some life, not the food I wanted. In fact, I will redraw, thank you. There we go. That's the one. All right, kids, we are now safe for the time being. Emphasis on for the time being. We find the old maiden and we are going to ask for some food which we receive, thankfully. Um, another Imperial... Um, catapult shot. Let's see. The Dredge of Corruption. We can fight these guys. Not a problem. I apologize if my commentary isn't terribly interesting right now. This chapter is really interesting from a gameplay perspective, and I love fighting the corrupted, but there's a lot of repetitious mechanics here. Which 
doesn't make it a bad chapter whatsoever. I'm just saying it may be significantly less fun to watch than it is to play. That will certainly not be the case for the next chapter, the last one I actually recall, and the one that, as I'm aware, is kind of infamous amongst the fandom. That one's, uh, something else. MC2M says strength is the chapter that makes you master combat. Oh, ain't that right. It's it's a really cool chapter in terms of its story and what you can get from it. And I distinctly recall really digging the boss. But a am I correct in saying that's the one that like people online tend to say, oh, this feels like the hardest chapter in the game or one of them, yeah? I, I don't know any of this for certain. I just know based on... The very limited reading I did before going into the game, as I didn't want to spoil anything for myself I hadn't already seen, um, strength is kind of notorious. Says, MC2M says that's the challenge that tends to make people stop, yeah? Alright, well, I remember beating it, so hopefully we're gonna be in good shape. <laughs> The dealer's handling his experience with corruption, it seems, a whole lot better than these poor folks are. And we get more scouts. Um, it is as before. The gate is blocked by more layers of corruption. The wagons cannot get through, so it must be destroyed. Alright. The Pauper Plague, a good opportunity to get some gold. So why not? Just five of them, that'll be nothing. You know you're in corrupted territory because the green filter has been cranked up to max. So it looks like if you stun the corrupted and then strike them, you have a much greater chance of knocking them down. Or knocking them to their knees, rather. Sir Malafal commends you for your bravery and offers you a reward. A whole lot of gold. Well, a whole lot of gold for this chapter, anyway. Just some grateful citizens. Excellent. Grateful citizens willing to sell us food. Superb. I will take it all, thank you very much. There we go, that ought to hold us. And it's still... or no, it's not the Cardinal Blade, my mistake. It's the Billy Clubs, which we definitely don't want for this map. They're cool weapons, no doubt, but not going to be particularly effective against the more uh, advanced forms of Corrupted. Even in the 
a grateful merchant. There will always be traders who stayed too long hoping to profit. You find a merchant and his family. You explain Captain Fiora's plan and help the merchant and his family onto the wagons. Only five uh, citizens left. Thank you, the merchant says, boarding the wagon. Should you find yourself short of gold, I'd be happy to give you a good price for any equipment you might want to trade. Does he offer to sell anything, though? That's my question. No. Alright. City streets. Nothing here. The drudge of corruption once more. Ooh, that was a failure, unfortunately, meaning we have to fight the whole lot of them. Or no, we get a second run at it. Look at them being all generous. Hmm. There we go. Nicely timed. Well, we can take them. Uh, hmm. Might as well call in some backup. Yeah, why not? I do appreciate the way they even attempt to contextualize the different gameplay styles or foci of the two uh, entries in the series um, in the story. Like with the revelation that when Callus played the game and, of course, uh, lived the life that brought him to the game, he just kind of wandered around for the most part indiscriminately killing magical creatures while you're actually interacting with way more people and trying to have more of a positive effect on society as um, exemplified by the fact that you have way more uh, contextually specific encounter cards and actually have partners with you on your journey. MC2M says, I was actually reading about the lore. Do, do I generally have the right of that? Callus um, obviously created this aggressively xenophobic empire and tried to wipe out any trace of the arcane from the world. So we're to take it that maybe the dust aside, in the first game, uh, the uh, opposition one faced from the courts of Skulls, Plague, and Scales was largely invited, as in he defiled tombs to wake the dead, and um, attempted to exterminate rat men and lizard men that were otherwise coexisting more or less peacefully, either within human realms or in their own secluded realms beyond. Oh, and it's another one of the uh, musketeer farmers. Yeah, we're gonna help him out, definitely. And we're gonna call in Estrella's scouts because we have three more uses and won't get many opportunities to bring them in. MC2M says a bit of that, and the dealer was more into fantastical creatures and magic. Uh, yeah, no, I get that. Um, it seems like he views himself as the last protector of things that progress would try to destroy. Whether they be living beings, artifacts, things like that. He kind of represents a romantic perspective on Hand of Fate's world versus Callus's more quote unquote enlightenment inspired ideals.
Like, it's quite clear that for the Empire, the goal is kind of progress, quote-unquote progress, and um, mastery over the land and the world at any cost, including human cost. MC2M explains it for us, the game of life and death changes the world depending on the owner, and Callus is about power. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. Hence why the dealers was just full of magical, but specifically not necessarily spiritual or religious occurrences and creatures. You arrived just in time, the warrior explains. I don't think I could have held them off for much longer. He's going to give us more equipment. We've run into this before. MC2M says the Corrupted arrived when Valenos, the dealer, was revived uh, by the mages. Uh, well, yeah, no, because I can tell he's clearly corrupted himself, but still has complete control over his, his body. What equipment is this guy offering us? The Gambler's Jewel? Yeah, I'll take it. We might need it for this. The Madman. <laughs> they say madness can be a blessing. Not I, however. I would never be so thoughtless. The journey comes with some confusion regarding logistics and food. What do children even eat? Malaclips had cried. In the end, you managed to bring the mage children safely to the Madmen near Forstford. Their home is an ominous building with high gates, barred windows, and faint screaming coming from within. It passes as an asylum disquietingly well. Right. We'll just drop these little munchkins off and be on our way to get that cure. Malaclips leads your ragtag bunch to the main door before turning to you and saying seriously, Please, perform the secret knock. Um... I don't know that one of these is right and the other is wrong. I don't recall being told about a secret knock. Um, so maybe just knock a tune? I don't think this has any effect on the story, or it shouldn't. If so, my, my memory of uh, the stream from two or three nights ago is incredibly poor. MC2M says, as for our character, interacting with the world and everything we do is both fragments of our past and actions that change the world in small ways until we arrive in the dealer's wagon. Well, yeah, as I understand it, the dealer is using both our own memories and some completely artificial experiences to more or less train us up to be ready to take on Callus at his game. In shorter terms, time shenanigans, the lesser game of life and death, yeah. Malaclips wipes an imaginary tear from his eye. Beautiful. Simply a masterpiece. That wasn't a secret knock, but I push it, I accept it anyway. Then, he merely pushes open the unlocked doors. You're met by two tall men, identical twins dressed in patterned nightgowns. Ira of the Vale told us you'd be coming, one of the twins says. I'm Barry, and this is Mary. They call us the Madmen, but it is only a name. They shove you aside and hurry the children in so inside. We're good sorts, aren't we, Barry? His twin nods as he brushes the children's hair and hands them nightgowns. Yes, indeed. But sometimes I forget we're merely acting, and I do mad things like uh, setting that farm on fire. Keeps the rabble off our trail, though, don't it? Mary nods as he brings out a plate of warm spiced breads. As the children warily settle down to eat spiced breads and butter, Mary asks you a favor. We'll need your help clearing out this place. Hasn't been an orphanage for a long time, has it? Not fit for children. The monster's in the burning room, Mary. Barry notes while cutting carrots. I'm gonna go kill the monster first. Barry leads you to the cellar door. It's in there. I've had to resort to going to town, down to town to buy our pickled vegetables. They scream like banshees when I ask them what blood they've pickled them in, though. Barry closes the door behind you. 
You follow the steps deep beneath the fortress until you find yourself in an underground cave. You hear a guttural moan. And it's just a blight terror. Nothing we ain't seen this chapter. The burning room might be just a little bit trickier to take care of. Because I'm pretty sure I can't beat a fire into a submission with a hammer, or at least I haven't learned how yet. nice and easy. Blight Terrors are effectively harmless on their own, but if you fight them in a large group, like we've had to a couple times uh, in this stream, uh, they can deal some damage just in the chaos of everything. You poke at the dead thing to see if it holds any treasure, but find nothing of value. Malaclips rubs, rubs his shoulder nervously as he gazes into the creature's cold, dead eyes. That dealt with, you return to the kitchen. Mary boils sheets in a massive steel vat while his brother prepares radishes for the stew. Their tummy is full of warm bread. The children find comfortable spots around the kitchen to nap. We'll extinguish the burning room. As you approach the stairs, a man in rags rushes past and barrels into an adjacent room. He peers out at you with mad eyes. That'd be Frida, Mary says behind you. He kept trying to climb Forsford's clock tower, so they sent him here. He's harmless. Frida slams the door closed, then open, then closed again. You arrive at the burning room. The room is literally on fire. Everything has been reduced to ash inside. Somehow, magic is keeping the fire contained within. We'll ask Mal what to do. The maid shrugs. Perhaps that's the answer? He points to a chubby, lizard-like creature the size of a small dog. It watches you cautiously from the corner of the room. A fire salamander. A hatchling at that. I'd have thought them long extinct. We'll try to placate the flame creature. Oh no. Eyes front. Two, maybe? Two, three, one. Okay. Thank you very much. You coo and offer cake to the fat little lizard. Intrigued, it waddles over to the door frame, licking its lips. You notice the flames recede as it approaches. The fires have been extinguished, but the room continues to smoke and smolder. Ask if he has anything else to do. Okay. So, with the salamander calmed, the eggs recede and the room becomes cool enough to enter. The chubby creature clambers up your leg and snuggles into your arms, gibbering softly to itself. The little beast gags and convulses in your arms until, with a tiny squawk, it coughs up an item that drops painfully onto your toe. So a small amount of injury in exchange for these damn billy clubs they've kept trying to give me. Determines its sense of right. No, thank you. Let us hope they never turn upon you or me. On the advice of Malaclips, those ones are prone to spontaneous combustion. You release the little creature outside. It gives your palm a warm little lick before it patters away to the cliffs nearby. If it is as they say, interest is With the problems resolved, the madmen insist you stay for supper. Seated on opposite ends uh, of a comically long dining table, you shout conversation at each other. Malaclips takes uh, quickly and jovially to the shouting. Ask how they know him. Yes, Malaclips stole, stole some squirrels from the orphanage once. The bard chokes into his bowl. The madmen seem nonchalant about the transgression. You were just a boy, but it doesn't make it right. We'd like those squirrels back sometime. The Empire. General Calamity, isn't it, Barry? Mary shouts as he hands out hunks of bread. Barry nods. I wouldn't think they were so bad, if only they didn't try to kill all us magic folk. Not to mention what they did to those poor lizard men. I remember, Barry continues, when my silk trader was a lizard man. Now they're all dead, except for the bloke hiding in the city. Weren't Malaclips Bellows back? Weren't the lizard men wiped out centuries ago? Barry scratches his crooked nose. At least you think he did. He's so very far away. Yes, it has been a while, hasn't it? We'll compliment the stew. You yell across the table that the stew is delicious. What? Mary shouts back. He says there's too much carrot in the stew. Malaclips joins in. The madmen look at each other confused. No, we can't marry you. 
Yes, I will marry you, Malaclips replies, reaching for his loot. It's real Armskirk wood, thank you for noticing. <laughs> so we'll finish eating and head on out. As you, reach, as you finish your stew, Malaclips brings out his loot. After the second song, the madmen politely suggest that it's time for you two to leave. The children giggle at the bard's silent indignation. With the mage children peering out behind them, the madmen near Forstford wave goodbye uh, from the front door. As the door closes, your companion collapses on his hands and knees, blood oozing from his mouth. He pulls himself wearily to his feet and groans, This cure can't come soon enough, coin slave. A couple more encounters, neither of which should be terribly important since we've already rescued all the citizens. But in the interest of being thorough, I will uh, trigger them all anyway. Alright, so time to head out of the city and on to our boss fight for this chapter. At long last, you arrive at the final gatehouse, the exit out of the old city. Time to leave. You usher the frightened citizens through the gate and to their escape. My thanks to you, Fiora says with a smile. I doubt we could have done anything more for the people of the old city. Halt! A voice shouts from beyond the gate. You turn to see a troop of Empire soldiers marching through the gatehouse. By decree of the Emperor, none are permitted to leave the old city. Captain Fior, you are to return to the Imperial City at once to report, their captain commands. Captain Fior scoffs, calling to the young captain blocking the gate. These people bear no mark of corruption. All they want is safe passage. Imperial decree or no, it is our duty to protect them. What good is a soldier who cannot follow commands, but is an empire without order, the young captain retorts proudly. By decree of the Emperor, none are permitted to leave the old city. Captain Fior draws her pistol, standing between the cowering old city refugees and the Emperor's decree. I will not stand down. And yeah, we're gonna call in her assistance. Makes perfect sense here. So it's all five of us versus um, this Imperial Captain, the likes of which we've already fought before as part of the dual quest line, and his backup. This shouldn't be too bad at all once we thin the herd a little bit. So yeah, after that whole chapter, the boss is not one of the corrupted. Captain Sterling. He hears the pleas from the old city but does not weep. Orders are orders. I fight for justice, not simply a ordered. This is how it must be. Let's take care of the musketeers first. I think the Musketeers might actually have a bit more health than the standard Guardsmen. Which is unusual. You typically expect, right, the, um... Uh, the ranged variant of uh, a particular faction's soldiers to be weaker, but... No, or more frail, I should say. Captain Sterling himself ought to drop like a sack of rocks after... Or now that we've finally whittled his support down. Once more. There we go. And I think Astraea's special ability is a simple stun. As you can see there, or saw there, she like tries to charge an enemy and kind of knock them upside the head to stun them. And that's the chariot chapter cleared. MC2M says I love the music of this game. Yeah, it's got a pretty solid soundtrack. Um, it doesn't seem to be like the broadest soundtrack in the world. Like there's not a million different songs for similar situations, but it doesn't really get grating at any point. Like a lot of aspects of the game or the series, I should say, the folks at Deviant really got a whole lot out of limited resources. They did a spectacular job with these, I think. These Emperor-decreed injustices have been on the increase of late, Captain Fior says. Something ill is growing from within. She pauses her ruminations and gives you a stern look. 
the Empire would do well to have somebody like you serving it. We've befriended Estrella the Soldier, making her our third proper, like, launch companion. And we'll receive the fourth and final companion included in the game at launch as a part of the next chapter, the Notorious Strength chapter. There is no problem Callus would not have solved through death, yet you show mercy. For finding safe passage through the plague-ridden city, we've earned Plague, The Alchemist, Yvonne's Cottage, Street Fighter, and The Pauper Dilemma, as well as The Empire's Burden, Marksman's Bane, Felvin's Favor, and The Elusive Charm. For saving a blacksmith from the old city, we got additional supplies, some leather armor. Definitely gonna want to take that. For befriending Estrella, we get the first card of her quest line, as well as her companion card. And for rescuing all the citizens of the old city, we receive Rethgar's Quake and the Grifter's Companion, something I definitely want to check out. And now the tokens we earned through encounter cards. For escaping with the Goblin Thief, we've earned Payment Due. For surviving Horse's suggestion to enter a trap dungeon, follow the Goblin and One Drunken Knight, both cards I recall very fondly. For our combat prowess with the Warrior's Axe, we get the Chieftain's Axe. Hell yes. And for making the Madman's Orphanage livable for orphans, I think the final card in Mal's personal quest line, The Cure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that done, I'm going to take our first five-minute break of the night. The usurper will not do so, and I must test you sorely before you arrive at his gates. And I will be back shortly to take on the notorious strength chapter. Don't go anywhere.
All right, folks, we are back. New chapter, new drink. Hope everybody's doing well this evening, or whenever you happen to be checking out the VOD, if you're watching us over on YouTube. Uh, as I said, it looks like Hand of Fate 2's got a good ways to go, and I am absolutely thrilled for that, because uh, this game just keeps introducing new stuff to us. I don't think it's ever going to fall into um, kind of a repetitious gameplay loop, the way awesome as it was, uh, Hand of Fate 1 kind of did toward the end. Um, but afterwards, as I, I discussed earlier on stream, thinking of playing a couple platformers for you guys, um, in particular, gonna play one of my all-time favorites, Psychonauts, the PS4 port, which is pretty solid. It's a decent port, I think. There's, like, I think some minor sound issues, depending on the port you play, but other than that, it's just fine. And then a game I played very little of before just kind of getting tired and walking away, I want to play what people consider to be one of the worst platformers to come out in the past, like, few years. Uh, Ukulele. I want to play through the whole thing, getting as close to 100%ing it as we could. What do you guys think about that? Or, I should say, uh, of the couple people active in chat, what, what do y'all think? Good idea? Something you'd watch? Might be entertaining? Ukulele, in particular, is full of incredibly painful puns. So, we, at the very least, could laugh at it together. Um... Just wanted to put that out there for everybody. Um, now we carry on to the strength chapter, and... It even turns against itself, even as it destroys the world around it. Yeah. Yeah, it's this one. Um... Stealing half of an ancient relic from an ogre has left you dying and cursed. Gear up and claim the other half of Odysseus' charm. So, we start with ten life. <laughs> A tenth of our standard disbursement as well as uh, plenty of dice events, meaning we're definitely going to want to bring Kolbjorn along. And the other mechanic to be aware of here is the boss, Draknar the Mighty. A high defense will help reduce damage from the ogre's devastating onslaught. I can tell you this much, he hits like a truck, so our two main goals in this chapter are going to be build up our defense and find ways to increase our max health. I believe. Um, let's see. What are they going to recommend to us? What does Estrella help with? Uh, oh, let's just retry Pendulum Gambits. Well, that's alright. Our supplies, we start with Leather Armor, which is very good. Five uh, additional max life, and some Healing Spirits. Huh. So I would say those are just fine, but instead of the Healing Spirits, I'm actually going to go for the Chieftain's Axe, because I would really like to start with, um, a much stronger weapon. Uh, MC2M, do you remember, do we fight a lot of Northerners in this chapter? I don't think so, it's just kind of a mishmash of everything, right? Equipment. Dark Thirst is there, that's fine. Definitely keeping the bloodletting vial for now. Uh, instead of the humble hammer, let's get the exquisite blade. Instead of the dead man's hand, we'll take Falden's favor. Not sure what Grifter's companion does, but I know we want it. Um, instead of... What was that? The Dark Grove Ring? Oh yeah, we don't need that. Um, we'll take Grifter's companion. Tell you what, instead of the Ring of Food, we'll take the Gambler's Jewel. Encounters. Definitely want the Shrine, that's a good call. Clan Eyebright, that's fine. 
Yeah, a lot of these are just fine. The Goblin Tracker, that's good. Instead of the Trading House, let's take... MC2M uh, asks, did I grab Healing Spirits? I did not. I actually swapped it out. Tell me if this is a good idea. I swapped it out for the Chieftain's Axe. I did grab the additional Max Life card, though. And we have the uh, Altar, or the Shrine, in our deck. We can put in more Platinum cards, which is great. We'll do that with the Man of the World. MC2M says take Healing Spirits for this. Um, okay. Should I swap it out for the Chieftain's Axe or the Leather Armor? I'm thinking, eh, as much as I hate it, uh, giving up the Chieftain's Axe for now. Yeah? Okay, there we go. Chieftain's Axe is probably not worth it. All right. Um, hmm. Uh, we'll throw in Street Fighter. Oh no, they've got Fallen Treasure? That's not a good idea. Follow the Goblin, maybe, though. Alright, do we see anything here that's cause for outright panic? I think we might be good. One second, gonna take a sip of this and then we're going to get right into it. Alright, ladies and gents, prepare for pain. MC2M says it's a bit of a mix, but it should work. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going for. Um, at least enough new cards to give us some tokens, but a fair few that should increase uh, our max health. You cannot face. You must know yourself, hold yourself, sharpen your wits, and your sword against the challenges ahead. The bitter taste of blood is the first indicator that you're still alive. Blind and disoriented, you make out a voice calling to you. A pair of strong hands shake you upright. Your vision steadies and Colbjorn's somber face swims into view. Now uh, let's see. Ask where we are. Colbjorn gestures you to be quiet. He presses his back up against a boulder beside you and grimaces, holding his side. As your head clears, a booming voice echoes out from deep in the foggy marsh. Oh, where have you crawled, ghasted mice? Let your insides be gut and bones be crunched. You peer around the rock, and from the mist steps an ogre, three times as tall as a man and with a lump and vicious face. His one good eye darts about wildly as he surveys the area hunting for something. The ogre grunts and scoops up a broken, shining trinket from the ground, splashed red with blood. Ruined with your dirty blood, wretched cut purses. Riven in two. His hideous face turns red. If thou listen here, I will find the twin, then I will eat thine eyes. The ogre lifts his club and smashes a tree trunk in anger. The tree creaks and crashes to the ground as Drachnar the ogre turns and disappears back into the mist. 
Kolbjorn grimaces as he holds his side, attempting to hide the severity of his injured. Here, you are injured. Eat. He throws you a medicinal herb bun. Weak to your bones, you gratefully take a bite. And the bread turns to ash in your mouth. With a sinking realization, you pull the other half of the ogre's trinket from your pack. Sure enough, you feel a wrongness emanating from it. Yeah, so food does not restore life. We can get life by other means, though, I believe. A stab of hunger hits your stomach. There's only one thing for it. You must steal back the other half from the ogre that almost killed you. The closest town is Draper, Colbjorn whispers hoarsely. We cannot hope to defeat an ogre now. Summoning your remaining strength, you lift yourself to your feet and stagger to town. I admire that you have oh, this is not great. Violence. Yet, if there's one thing that the usurper has taught me, it's that violence can sometimes answer questions that otherwise have none. Your day's travel is slow and long. The sun's rays now gone, a chill fills the marshlands. To avoid the swelling bogs, you press on to higher ground and happen upon an old road through the marshlands. Oh, we can use healing spirits in the camp? That is a great idea, thank you. To the left, you see a group of cloaked thieves blocking the road. Okay. To the right, you make out a group of Empire brigands taking shelter by the side of the road. No other safe passage through the mire, who do we fight? Um... Right now, with what I have... Well, really, it depends, but... I dare say... Switching to a slightly heavier weapon and fighting the Empire is probably a safer bet because they're not quite as mobile. The cold chill of night builds as you ready yourself for combat. We can see our healing spirits there. Yeah, this is a good old-fashioned combat-heavy challenge. I dig it. See if we can't get some decent loot out of this, eh? With the brigands defeated, you notice they were guarding some equipment hidden off the path in the mire. You slide down the bank to the treasure. Oh dear. Yeah, I'll take Colbjorn's additional die. I need some equipment. Oh, hell yes. Optionally, judge the nudge the result onto the next card during a wheel gambit. Unlimited use, I believe, so that can be very, very handy. Now we're going to go in camp. Before you travel further. And at MC2M's suggestion, we're going to use the healing spirits. I think... Maybe we'll use two of its uses. Keep one in the back pocket. But that'll allow me to relax just a little bit. Street Fighter. These are actions I'd expect of the usurper, but from you, I had hoped to see better. One day you come across a bare knuckle competition in an alley. An old man with a few remaining teeth notes your interest. When choosing your opponent, he wheezes, remember that your purse, if you survive, will depend on how quickly you beat them. Uh, if we want to take somebody down quickly with what we've already got, um, I'm thinking we go for the thieves with blades. 
Yeah, that's what we'll do. An assassin and four standard uh, thugs. We can probably take these guys. Quite handily, that. Just going to TARDIS our way down into the arena to meet the assassin for the first time properly. Like a knife in darkness, the assassin waits. Assassins perform quick heavy attacks. Use evade or perish. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, and do I not have my companion? That's a real shame. Ooh. That was very bad. Almost got him. Now on to the big guy. Fortunately, he can be stunned just like any of them. Now if he just stands still... Jesus, really? Anything to take down that amount of gold I'm gonna make from this little competition, eh? Where on earth is he? Whoa! There we go. That's a bit more like it. Maybe I should have stuck to reposts against him, but we got him. That's the most important thing. And should earn just a little bit of gold. crowd grows weary watching these marathons, the organizer laments as he hands you your meager earnings. Finish them quicker next time. Oh, screw you. That was about as good as you could do. Hey, hey we got gold at least. Uh, or health, I should say. Can't complain. A wetland ambush. We've been ambushed by northerners, oh dear. It's just the standard, um, raiders, though, so shouldn't be too much trouble, I don't think. Oh, can we not repost northerners with this type of weapon? Looks like we cannot. Their attacks are too powerful. Oof. Come on then, there we go. Whew. Both of them at once there. Did, did they hit me somehow when I wasn't looking? Because it looked like my health dropped quite dramatically over the course of that battle. Started out with 40-something, didn't we? Did they hit me somehow while I was performing that finisher? Huh. Anyway, we get some food. MC2 M says, be careful with the finisher while running to finish the enemy, they can hit you. So, not during the animation itself, but after, or between, when I actually uh, press the trigger to initiate the finisher and uh, actually begin the animation. Gotcha. So that's what happened there. What do we have over here? Unrest in Iron Peak once again. Because I want the token here and we're doing okay on life, I'm going to visit the marketplace. 
Few people seem to choose the risk of shopping in such a public place these days, and those that do never linger for long. In a quiet corner of the market, you find a desperate man attempting to sell an unusual assortment of oddities. He picks up a statue of a three-headed creature, saying, This statue of a healing spirit from the distant kingdom of Duncia is exactly what you need to survive the next attack by the Prince of Poisons. we will ask about prices. You ask how much gold each item costs, but he seems reluctant to name a price. Whatever you think it's worth, he says with a nervous smile. We'll uh, buy a map. The map reveals a little about the countryside surrounding the town of Iron Peak. As you turn to ask how much gold you owe, a supernatural chill travels up your arm and freezes your heart. Uh, curse. Seriously? They deal more damage while I'm snared, which is not great, but not terrible. Sorry, stranger, the stall owner says, suddenly packing up the rest of his wares. But I stole these from a particularly vengeful warlock, and his magic prevents me from just throwing them away. Good luck with that one. The man kicks the table over and flees down a back alley. You lose sight of him in the gloom and decide to abandon this godforsaken town. So we'll need to go back one more time to get the other, uh... The other item from the Curse Merchant, I believe. Too many words obscure the actual truth of the matter. Sometimes simple actions tell all. Approaching Draper's gates, you notice a woman of enormous stature dressed in a blue tunic and leather apron. Three smithing hammers hang from her waist. Our final companion, uh, included in the game at launch, ladies and gents, and one of my favorites. The woman rushes forward and embraces you, burying you in her chest. The gods be praised, she cries. I surely thought you'd be dead. She releases you and looks up and down. Look at you, she says before you can get a word in. That foul beast didn't hold back now, did it? MC2M says unrest in Iron Peak shops are all about getting curses, which can be useful in endless mode. Good to know. She whips around to face your companion. Colbjorn, she bellows. I thought I told you to keep him out of trouble. I warned you about Draknar, and look what's happened. You should know better than to steal from an ogre. Colbjorn wanders past the fuming woman and down to the river to fish in peace. As she pauses for breath, you seize your chance to interrupt. Uh, we'll ask who she is. I'm Ariadne, the blacksmith's daughter, she says, surprised. We met at the Black Ale pub the night before you set off to steal Odysseus' charm. I almost broke your wrist arm wrestling, remember? Uh, we'll ask about the charm. She pokes at the broken ornament gingerly. Forgive me if I don't take it. The curse of the Odysseus' charm only affects the wielder. If it makes you feel any better, the ogre is probably starving now, too. From the looks of the silver work, this is an old relic indeed. Draknar, she says, or Draknar the Mighty, as he is known, has lived in these parts for an age. Many have tried to fell the beast before you two misfits, that's for sure, she explains, but few live to tell their tale. The ogre is notorious for ambushing travelers and traders alike. Not even Empire soldiers are safe in these parts, accumulated a wealth of treasures plucked from his victims including that cursed relic you have now. So we'll continue on. Ariadne shakes her head. One blow from Dragnar's club would crush you. You won't survive it unless you get a good set of armor on you. Listen, I run a traveling forge. It's currently heading here. Come see us. We'll sort you out with some good and proper armor. The piece of the Desia's charm weighs heavy in your pack. You wish to fling it into the mire, but some strange magic stays your hand. Starving and injured, you rest a while in town. So this whole chapter is going to be based around acquiring enough material to uh, allow Ariadne to sort of kit us out with some spectacular arms and armor. And another ambush. Really need to get rid of these damn daggers then, if this is going to be a constant thing. We've been attacked by the Empire this time who we hopefully should still be able to repost. And yes, we can repost them. For somewhat muted damage, but I'll take it.
I will say this, Kalos, uh, didn't devote the most time to choosing an insignia, did he? For, so, for how much flavor is associated with the Empire, and how much, oh, damn it, uh, like, detail is included in all of their arms and armor, you'd think they'd go for a bit more than just a triangle, but... Let's use those healing spirits. As Colbjorn takes care of the last watchman for us. Got more food, okay. Stop in camp, is there anything available here? The bloodletting vial. Can't quite afford it, that's fine. The Man of the World. Greetings, fellow traveler. A cheerful fellow clad in a brilliant yellow surcoat passes you on the road one day. The man gasps and bends down to gape at the artifact on your belt. Lovely, just lovely. He pulls out a hefty scroll. I've been documenting every nook and cranny of this beautiful land, and my soul is shaking with delight at the thought of sharing it with you. So he's going to reveal the map for us. Excellent. One combat encounter that's mandatory in the Goblin. May your vistas be breathtaking and your tree climbing be non-lethal. With an enthusiastic wave, the man shoulders his heavy rucksack and continues his journey, whistling all the while. So we'll head over to the Goblin Tracker. The tunnels leading from Goblin Town provide easy access to the surface world, provided you know where you're going. Unfortunately, right now you find yourself completely lost. Rounding a bend, you meet a lone goblin archer, his face painted in lurid colors. He skulks sheepishly behind a boulder, squinting at the path ahead. Human, he hisses. Or stoat. I can never tell the difference. The Redcock clan is tasked with keeping these roads clear but a monster with big, gross crystal warts is guarding the path ahead. There's no way forward. We'll ask about the Red Claw clan first. The goblin crosses his arms. Ours is a great and storied clan of warriors, heroes, and goose wranglers. We have air watched over these goblin roads, except on Tuesdays because it's Two Soup Tuesday down at Smunson Soup Emporium. Um, okay, I will break out the axe and chop down the terror, something we've gotten a ton of experience with. You can't, the little goblin says, shaking his head. It would shame the clan if an outsider performed our duties. Only the Red Claw clan may guard the goblin roads. Unless... Yes, this could work. Kneel down, human. You kneel in front of him. He wipes the lurid grease paint from his face and slaps it messily onto yours with both hands. Rise, fellow Red Claw! Rise and punch that monster right in the jug! Your artifact is empty now and will be of little use to you here. So we are now an honorary goblin. I feel... I feel so proud. You know how this goes by now. And there we go. And it looks like once you break the Terror's armor, you can chop it down through standard melee attacks if you wanted to. Don't really see why you would, but uh, it's an option, I guess. With the passage cleared of the Blight, the Goblin runs over to you. You did it! Not that I had my doubts. Not that I had 50 gold on that creature knocking your block off. He surveys the passages leading out of the chamber. The roads are clear now. If you'd like, I can lead you back to the surface. The goblin points at a spot on your map. Would you like to surface here? Ask about other exits. Yeah, that'll do. You follow the little tracker for some time, finally emerging from a tree stump. Farewell, fellow Red Claw. Remember to join us for Two Soup Tuesday, the goblin says, receding back into the tunnels. So we've earned a new token. Excellent. That was a nice, straightforward little event. Since we've got more combat on the way, let's pull out the sword. Your day's travel is slow and long. 
Sun's rays now gone, yep. What's our choice this time? Agreed silencer. MC2M says you can also kill that terror by removing its health without destroying its armor at all. Now that's interesting. I, I assume that would be infinitely uh, more tedious, but it's interesting that we have um, that option. Or a frost shaman. Uh, hmm. I'm going to fight the shaman. The silencers are just fast enough I don't entirely trust myself to avoid taking damage. I have a slightly better chance with these folks, I think. Or this person, rather, if it's just the one, yeah. She's casting her healing magic, despite there being no one here. Very nice. I assume it has some other effect. And there we go. Not many of these uh, elites are that tricky on their own. I'm trying to think, maybe like the Barbarians, or the Berserkers, rather. With the Raiders defeated, you notice some equipment hidden in the Path of the Mire. Yep, here we go again. You kidding me? Um, it's not worth it. It's not worth it right now. Don't know if we'll need some assistance at the Forge. You need for a column of smoke and the clang of metal are the first signs that you're in the right place. As you round the bend, you see the forge outside the gates to Blackwater. You spy your new acquaintance Ariadne assisting a blacksmith on the bellows. Ah, there you are, Ariadne says with a smile. She removes her gloves to wipe her brow. These are the two I was telling you about, Anders, she says to the blacksmith. I almost broke this one's wrist in an arm wrestle. So I hear you're out to fight an ogre, the blacksmith says. My specialty is improving armor and helms and the like. I must admit, it's normally only horseshoes and farming equipment I'm in these days, so it may take a while. I assure you, it'll be well worth your time. We'll ask him to upgrade our armor then, which I think means we lose it for the map, but get back a vastly superior version later on. You hand the smith your armor and he begins to examine the item thoroughly, inspecting every joint and seam. Yes, I can certainly improve this, but it will take several days. I'm heading to Cottonmore. Meet me there and the job will be done. Oh, if you bring another item to me there, I'll see if I can improve that one as well. The swamp lands. So we get lost in the swamp, perhaps. But we easily find our way out. With some luck, you find your way higher and higher to drier ground. Back on the path, you continue your journey. Another combat encounter, so silencers. And an Imperial Captain. I'm going to fight the Captain. And they feel the need to introduce them yet again? Okay. Command falls on the head of those who are loud, brash, and fortunate.
That is gonna get him. There we go. Yeah, MC2M says stirring in the mire is both combat to endanger you and equipment to reach that 60 defense. So, with that in mind, I'm definitely going to be using Kolbjorn if we need uh, his uh, assistance with the die. Not that time. What do we get? The bloodletting vial. Um, only against corrupted. Yeah, I don't think we need that. The old maiden will ask for longer life. Something of an assistance. The King's Road, not yet. An ambush, maybe? Or no, the Market Thief. Here we go. We're definitely gonna need that gold back. Where do we think it is? Where do we think it is? One, maybe? One, two? Two or one? Um, hmm. One? No, oh, man. So we, we lose that gold. I'm not terribly fond of that card. So we do get our new and improved leather armor. Simply the Has 18 defense, which helps. Oh, we can ask him to upgrade it again. Well, yeah, absolutely. Oh no, it can only be upgraded once. Oh, he's going to give us a better shield. MC2M says Market Thief is essential for the future. Okay, we'll keep it in the deck then. Yeah, go ahead and upgrade the shield. The Alchemist. That says little for its practitioners, however. Countless jars and obscure artifacts clutter the room. On a central workbench, a peculiar glass beaker simmers over a flame. Ah, I see you found my laboratory, then, a voice exclaims. But from behind, a pile of dusty books. A robed figure emerges, clad in a pointy hat and pair of thick spectacles. He smiles, here to create the elusive elixir of life? Or perhaps it's gold you desire? All is possible through alchemy. Alas, I have yet to prove that such things are indeed possible, he explains. No matter. Say, would you care to assist me with my experiment? Very well. Let's begin. Take a jar and place its contents in the beaker, he says as he dips his quill in an inkwell and prepares to write. Remember, you must keep the elixir pure. Okay, so what do we want to do here? Do we want to go for all of the ingredients of a certain color? I think that's how it works. Okay. And blue would be interesting, I think. Blue beetles. Do we want blue or red? Well, no, blue gets us the token, I want to say. Like, yellow is for gold, red is for life. This one gets us the token, perhaps? Look at the color of my status. Um, no, so I see that. Um, but the only one this corresponds to would be fame. So, huh. Let's, uh... Blue is fame. Okay. So, does it matter which one I get, uh, as far as the token? Or, I'm trying to remember. I know I got the token on this one before, one time. But, or do I just need to make any pure elixir to receive the token? Because if that's the case, I'm definitely going for life. I'm thinking life, actually. Let's 
see. Hold on, taking a quick drink. Go with my guts. That's that's a terrible piece of advice to give me because I have the worst uh, decision making ability in the world. Um, I'm actually gonna go with this one because it seems like just seems like fame. Maybe that's well, no. No, sorry, I'm going to go left. That'll be... Shit. Um, hold up, tell you what. I've got an idea. I've got an idea. Alright, we'll go with blue for now. The jar contains a collection of blue beetles. You place one in the beaker and it dissolves instantly. The liquid gains the faintest tint of blue. Excellent, the alchemist says as he scrolls feverishly in his ledger. Now pick another. We reach for the next one. The blue feathers. The jar contains dried blue feathers. Sprinkle a handful into the beaker and they dissolve instantly. The blue elixir intensifies. Remarkable, the alchemist mutters as he continues to write in the ledger. This is looking promising. Now pick one more. Okay. Just so I know, selecting right means it's actually going to give me the card to the right. Yeah? I would think so. Yeah, it, it doesn't appear to be reversed, so... If we do this, we should get a pure blue elixir. It says yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, there we go. As you add the blue mushrooms, the mixture glows an intense blue, lighting up the room. You did it! The alchemist's eyes grow wide with excitement. The elixir of kings! He drips a large ladle into the glowing broth. Here, drink it. It'll bring you luck. The liquid is surprisingly cold, considering it was boiling, but moments earlier. It takes your breath away as it runs down your throat, energizing your body to the tips of your fingers and toes. Your mind clears and you find a newfound resolve for the mission at hand. The alchemist- oh shit, I chose incorrectly, of course. We needed to create the elixir of life. Uh, the elixir of life would be the red one, of course. Thanks you profusely for your assistance before returning to his ledger. Well, this can still be helpful. Stirring in the mire. Anarchists. And bandits. Berserkers and a shaman. I'm going to fight the bandits. I will say, um, un the unlock conditions for, like, the random encounter cards tokens in this game seem to be a little bit more demanding than those in Hand of Fate 1, or a lot of them, I should say. Uh, I guess to compensate for the fact that they aren't the totality of the, uh, content you're going to be running into. A lot of them anymore are actually kind of auxiliary. Ow. Dang it. This is not the best map for fighting anarchists, is it? use a better weapon. Jesus. I put so many of them in the deck, too. MC2M says a lot of these harder encounters also have replay value. Yeah, they do. 
Um, in Hand of Fate 1, usually, if you didn't meet the conditions for uh, securing a card's token, you just kind of failed it, right? You didn't get anything in exchange. But here, um, a lot of them, I'm thinking the Market Thief, Arm Wrestling, the Duel, they all give you something uh, as long as you pull out a, a solid performance. All right, let's see what the thieves were hiding. Good, good. So I've gotten every single artifact in my deck, but not a single weapon. Um, it's a knockdown bomb, that's pretty good, actually. MC2M says, I remember fondly the Hand of Fate 1 encounter demanding upwards of 200 health, otherwise insta-death. Is, is that part of the Blood Auction quest line? The one I deliberately tried to avoid early on? Oh, it's for the Dragon Equipment quest line. That, that makes sense. Well, we got the sacrificial blades if we had any friggin' gold, which we do not. Um. What's over here? Arm wrestling, here we go. This can give us some gold. That might be enough if we also sell the... Mm, hold on. Goodness gracious, they're expensive. Yeah, I'd have to sell both of my artifacts, and I'm not totally comfortable doing that right now. I will buy some food. No, no, I won't. Um, we've got one more food. Oh, it's the swamp. Joy. Yeah, I'll take the die. Thank you. And it gives me <laughs> the one point we need. Definitely going to need some food now. Yeah, I'll just take the... the cost. We've gotten really unlucky with the equipment lottery this time. Okay, so he'll stick around in case we find some more um, equipment, which is great. Goblins. Follow the goblin. The trouble. Were it in my hands, I would never deal with them. You spy a goblin, half hidden in a copse of trees, counting the gold weighing down his sack. Startled by your presence, he beats a hasty retreat through a magical portal. We'll follow. This could be really good or really bad if there are some health... Uh, chests in here, we might get out okay. Got some food, that'll be helpful. Okay. Yeah. 
Oof. Oh man. There we go. Oh yeah, man. Plenty of gold, we'll need to come back here. That is the exit, I take it. And there we go. Did we collect everything? Well, no health in here, it would appear, but we got plenty of food. And tons of gold that we can definitely use to buy some better equipment. You exit through the glowing door to find yourself in more or less the same place as before. The crunching of leaves underfoot betrays the goblin running further into the forest. Oh, this is interesting. We'll need to do a series of these encounters then. But first things first, let's set up camp. Still the sacrificial blades, still can't really afford them. Unless, uh, I'll go ahead and sell the bloodletting vial for him. I'm so... Nerv- uh, mc 2 says you can sell the healing spirits too. Yeah, it's just for a coin though, we're... We're fine there, I wanna say. Oh, I'm so nervous about this run, you guys. Oh, the shrine, thank God. No one will listen. Yes, please, old gods, please help. Sunshine appears, yep. Additional max life. Oh my god. Oh, that was so, so needed. The problem is I don't think I'll have enough, uh arms or armor to meet the additional condition for this, uh, this particular quest, so we may have to go through and do it again. The goblin turns to see you still in pursuit. He shouts in exasperation, leave me be, meddling human. So into another treasure dungeon. And if we do need to go back through for the, uh, the additional token, I may actually just do that off-screen before tomorrow night's stream and uh, begin the stream examining the uh, cards the token unlocks. Just because this seems like kind of a lengthier quest. Okay, what do we got here? Got a lot of gold, got a lot of food. Nice and easy. Okay.
We're not gonna want for food when this quest line is finally through, are we? That was close. There we go. So you have a small grace period after stepping on a bear trap. That's very good to know. Whew. We already got all of those, right? Okay. We should be good to go then. Even if we miss like one chest, that won't be too bad. These are so lucrative already. There we go. Nice and easy. You find yourself face down in a pile of leaves, being shaken awake by Kolbjorn. Slightly dazed, you hear the jangle of coins in the distance. Third time's the charm, hopefully. You catch up to the goblin just as he leaps into another portal. His face contorts into a look of irritated disbelief as your eyes meet. Here we go again. These are kind of fun little diversions. Still no health, and it looks like less treasure overall here. Hmm. At least once we step on a bear trap once, it appears to be disarmed. Whew! Whoopsie. Okay. There we go. MC2M says try not to be too greedy. I will. I will. These haven't been too bad on the whole so far, so I'm not worried yet. I'll actually call myself satisfied right there. If we don't find any armor to buy, I mean, it's kind of a, a moot point. Specifically a helm. A helm would be great right about now. The, go the portal deposits you directly in the path of an oblivious Kolbjorn, bowling him over. As you pick yourself up off the ground, you spy the elusive goblin chasing over a hill. Here we go again. We're definite. Panting, the goblin blows his horn, producing a weak wheeze. Curse you! Leave me be! Wearily, he hefts his gold sack into the portal before tumbling after. MC to him says, I think this is the last one. Looks like it. We've got him after this. One more for the road.
I think I was an idiot and didn't put a lot of uh, armor cards in my equipment deck. Ouch. At the outset of this chapter. Not remembering that I needed to provide all of my own armor. In fact, I'm just going to take all this stuff and walk right the hell out. We've got more than enough gold. When you emerge from the portal, you find yourself in a luxurious sitting room. Green lanterns cast uneasy shadows on the walls. Lying exhausted on a woven rug in the center of the room is the goblin. He sighs at your appearance. My, you are persistent. I'd offer some murk tea if you hadn't pursued me relentlessly and barged unwelcome into my home. I'll ask where we are. His face cracks into a mischievous grin. You're in Goblin Town, human, where the sky is made of stone and the roast lizard is the best in the Empire. He gestures at the window when your jaw drops. The sky is indeed made of stone. The city waiting beyond has been carved into a vast cavern. The street below is host to a market lit by the uneasy green lanterns. Goblins and hooded figures peruse the wares, giving wide berth to giant, rodent-like beasts of burden. You swear you see a lone Empire soldier before she disappears into the crowd. He sighs at your appearance. Okay, so we're back here. Demand gold. He tips the sack of gold towards you. The goblin's face crinkles sadly. Take it. Plenty of gold. Excellent. As you grab hold of the sack, he blows his horn, opening a portal at your feet. Next time you want to reach Goblin Town, consider using a more conventional entrance. He gives a half-hearted wave. And we get the Goblin Town token. Oh, it's the gnomes again. Well, this is nothing we can't deal with. What you got? Whew. MC two M says, "Feel free to ask if you want to get the token." Uh, I will, but give me just a second to see what we've got here. D does it have something to do with giving them a pair of twin blades specifically? That way. The two brothers can have a weapon each, or... Yeah, actually, what, what do we need to do for the token here? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, so I would need to give up the sacrificial blades. Um, given the the map we're on, I have to refuse. But it's good to know what we're at, what we need. The swamp again. Right on the money. Yeah, and we, we can't upgrade the shield, right? Since you've already done a job on it. Uh, we are so not going to get the optional token for this one. You spy a column of smoke in the distance. Wreckage strewn across the road alerts you to the fate of the traveling forge. You rush to the forge and find Anders sitting on a wooden stool amidst the debris. Startled, but otherwise okay. Ah, he says, looking up. I was hoping you'd find me here. The ogre Drachnar ambushed the forge while I was traveling to Brayton. 
I'm fine, he continues, tearing up a little, and the forge can be rebuilt. It's Ari that I'm worried about. She stormed off in a rage. Her heart is in the right place, but I fear she's no match for Draknar by herself. Without a working forge, I can do little more to help you in your quest for the Adesia's charm, the smith continues. Please help Ari before she does anything foolish. No other option. You set off towards the ogre's lair in search of Ariadne. One more ambush. A whole lot of northerners this time. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to, uh, off camera, run through this a second time with a, a deck just loaded to the brim with armor to unlock the uh, second token, which I shall. Sacrificial Blades. Ceremonial Blades used to banish fallen mages. Thanks to that curse, we do actually kind of have to look out for the trappers this time around. Oh, they hit me in the middle of my uh, special animation again. Oh, that's not good. There we go. go. Nice. MC2M says use that artifact. Um, yeah, you know, I actually totally forgot about it. It also seems like I unfortunately loaded my deck down with too many artifacts. We got food and more food. Every city has the dark alleys civilized would be better to avoid. Of course, that's also where you'll find that's um a whole lot of guards. Doth mine eyes spy better armor? Um Huh. Let's uh try to not fight the massive horde of enemies at next to no health. It's the same exact thing, but with the Empire instead of, uh, I think it was the Northerners. We're screwed. <laughs> no way around it, folks. We're just kind of screwed on this run. Entirely my fault due to not preparing my equipment deck properly. Everything else worked out fine. The Wraith. Spurned on eternally by rage and sorrow. Yeah, we're going to want to get to her immediately. Oh. Yep, that's it. Um. You can see why folks ain't particularly fond of strength, can't you, folks? Um, I would give it one more go, but I actually have some emails I need to turn around uh, regarding that course I'm I'm helping teach so I'm afraid after this we're gonna have to hang it up for tonight I'm sorry we didn't make more progress but tomorrow hopefully we should be able to take on strength quite easily and uh, get a bit further into the game unhappy with your appearance perhaps we can make some small for clearing the goblin roads we unlock new appearances oh goblin war paint that's kind of cute I suppose MC2M says you also probably would have died from the lack of armor since you take damage from that. Very true. Uh, we did unlock Goblin Town, though, which is extremely useful. Think. Do not continue to fail me. I have need of your greatest efforts. 
So with that, thank you all for tuning in or watching us lot, um, uh, after the fact on YouTube's VOD. Uh, I appreciate you all being here, and thank you for sharing yourselves and your time with me this evening. Uh, oh, no problem, MC2M. I'm just happy to uh, be able to entertain some folks. Uh, do wish I got to do just a little bit more tonight, but I think... What, basically what people say is, for at least the first half of the game, strength is far and away the uh, challenge that's likeliest to kill you. Uh, so from here on out, we ought to have slightly smoother sailing. Uh, I'm just going to have to extensively retool my equipment deck. Like, for, for instance, we don't need that or that. Keep the weapons, maybe. We have the Bastion of Purification. Since we can get a free shield, we don't need that. Those. And that. That's already looking just a bit better. Alright, we'll give this deck a try tomorrow night stream at 6. Please join us then. Until then, thank you all so much for sharing yourselves and your time with me this evening. I hope everybody takes care of themselves and their loved ones in this trying time. And I hope you'll join me tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Time for more Hand of Fate 2. Thanks everybody, we'll see you then. Take care!